I want to talk about 9-11, September 11, 2001. Um, I joined the Army in 2004. Um, I joined as an intelligence analyst. And interestingly enough, I tried to join before that, but let's, let's rewind the clock and talk about you know, where everybody has a different story on where they were. This is one of those events that you remember exactly where you were, that it's, it's almost like post-traumatic stress disorder. You can relive that moment. You know all the details. And September 11, 2001 was Tuesday morning. I was in Miami Southridge Senior High School, and I was in the social studies class. Now, the classroom that I was in, we didn't have an actual social studies teacher. It was a coach. I can't remember his name, but the coach was acting as the social studies teacher. And essentially, the classroom wasn't even a classroom either. It was a part of the hallway that they partitioned off. Like they put like some uh, temporary walls and kind of made it a room. Like it didn't have a door. So the, the temporary walls created like a, like a, a turn where you kind of came into the room by coming around a corner of these temporary walls and it was a really it was just a makeshift classroom because they were running out of space and they needed that class and they didn't have a teacher so they added this uh this coach so on in the mornings i don't remember if it was every morning or um yeah i think it was every time we had the class that the the first five minutes of the class would be spent doing um he would show a pre-recorded news clip so something he recorded from the night before so coach would have us write down, you know, these these different things from the news, like five facts or whatever, and then pick a random student to have them brief to the class. So that morning on September 11, 2001, he forgot to uh, record. Uh, he forgot to record a session. He forgot to record it at home. So he didn't have anything prepared that morning. So he decided that he was going to instead just watch the news live. So he pulls the TV out. He you know plugs in the cable cord into the wall, and he turns on the TV. And sure enough, we see, you know, one of the, I don't remember which tower, uh, with the smoke coming from it. And just a few seconds later, the second plane hits. And everyone is in shock. And I remember some kid going, and he said, what movie is that? And Coach looked at everybody, and then Coach, we all were just kind of staring in disbelief. And he just said, everybody go call your parents right now. And everybody ran out the room, and it was just chaos the whole school everybody was running out of their classrooms and everybody ran down to the to the, the phone booths and you know kids who had cell phones were grabbing their cell phones and people were just going absolutely insane it was just crazy so i decided it wasn't made any sense for me to go ahead and call anybody i just decided i need to get out of here i need to walk out of here so i i grabbed I just walked right out the front door and started walking home because, I mean, everything was nuts. It was absolute insanity. Um, the streets, people, like traffic was, it was just absolutely nuts. A little added background. Um, I, I grew up in New York. I grew up in the Bronx and uh, most of my family uh, um, lives in New York. So as I was walking home, the, the, what started to go through my head was, was anybody there? One of my uncles is a police officer, and he's stationed down in Manhattan, and that was that was going through my mind. My then it started to click. There were some other things. I had a one of my uncles um, was a fire marshal in one of the buildings, and so I'm freaking out. We're I'm panicked. I get home, everything's in disarray, and you know. My uncle, who was the fire marshal, he ended up evacuating his, um, I don't know if it was his floor or whatnot, and then after getting everybody to safety, he decided that the best way for him to get out of the city, because everything was completely in disarray, and there was just people everywhere, and the roads were closed, and it was just chaos, he decided to go, he used to be a, a train conductor uh, for the New York Transit Authority, so he went down into the subway and started to walk from Manhattan down through the tunnels, like headed in the direction of, of the Bronx. This is around the time that the building collapsed and then he was stuck in a tunnel in the dark. And he walked from Manhattan to, you know, to the Bronx and showed up at my aunt's house probably about a day later. It took, it took him a whole day to get home. And when he got there, he was covered in soot, which meant he was probably covered in, you know, the pulverized bodies of people. And he didn't say a word. He just walked into the house, walked to the room, and went to sleep. And I think he slept for like a whole day. And he was traumatized by that event. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm sure it sticks with anybody. In addition to that, you know, my, my uncle, who was a police officer, he was a first responder down in, in the World Trade, and thankfully he's all right. But I'm, I'm sure they're all affected by, you know, breathing in toxic, you know, the, some of the things that were in the air. And there's there's a bunch of other things, in, including the trauma of the experience and just stress and numerous things that, they, that will affect them for the rest of their lives. In addition, um, one of my cousins who um, ended up becoming my roommate later on, she... She had a job interview. Now, this is very interesting because of her her personality. She is the type of person where, you know, she's she can be a little flaky. I love her to death, but, you know, sometimes she shows up a little late. And so, you know, she can, you know, there's a little bit of less than reliability. But for the most part, you know, she's a great person. But, like, sometimes she can just kind of be, you know, she said she was going to be there and she wouldn't be there. Or you try to call her or text her, she's not going to answer you right away. Like, that's not the person you call right away when you're having an emergency. But... It, it just so happens to be that that day, that personality trait, that little quirk of hers actually, you know, benefited her. It, it may have saved her life. She had a job interview on the 90th floor or something and slept through it and then woke up and found out the whole world was different. So following this event, everything was really, you know, in flux. You know, we, we went to war with Afghanistan and numerous things were happening i decided that i wanted to join the army like within a week's time or whatever i was talking to a recruiter and i was ready to go first i tried to join the marine corps um and there were some some obstacles to that so i went over to the army recruiter and um the army recruiter was like yeah you're kind of gonna kind of run the same things i was trying to join the infantry and in my mind i was like marines or you know a lot of my family members of mine were marines and so I wanted to join the Marine Corps, and then they told me there was a couple of issues. Um, I'm flat-footed. I have asthma in my history, and they were like, nope. I went over to the Army for the same thing. They said the exact same thing. So, nope, that wasn't happening. So ultimately, that, that kind of just went away. And, and my original dream in life, like I had a real solid, I don't know if it was a solid plan, but I definitely had a plan. My goal was to move to New York after high school. Um, well, I was in college yet, you know, figuring out the whole college thing. But I was going to move to New York following high school and save up some money to eventually actually go to Canada. I wanted to go to Second City, which is a famous city for improv. Uh, very famous people on Saturday Night Live um, all got their start there. Mike Myers, Will Ferrell, just tons of people. And I was studying improv. I had books on it. And my father bought me books on improv. And my goal was to get noticed and get on Saturday Night Live and be a writer and um, maybe do a weekend update. You know, that was that was what I wanted to do, and I had a very you know clear path. Whether that was going to work out or not, that's what I wanted to do. And 9/11 completely changed that. 9/11 changed my perspective completely, and I thought I don't know what's going to happen in the world, and um, I don't know if that's feasible. New York's going to be different. Uh, maybe the culture's going to be different. Who knows? And I thought things are going to get hard, and I don't really have a choice. Several people in my generation had all joined the military, and I saw that as a viable option. So. It, that initial join was out of pure, you know, it was it was hasty and it wasn't really thought out. But after a while, I was like, man, I really I really do want to do that. So following high school, you know, I was um, I got into weightlifting and I was trying to get my you know my you know things up. And I had spoke to a recruiter and I was like, hey, is there a possibility that maybe we can revisit this? Like, what can I do? Like my you know my flat feet isn't that big a deal and I can get over my asthma or whatever. And uh, that, that wasn't an option. That was not an option. So I graduated high school in 2003. Or rather, I graduated in 2004. In 2003, the Iraq War kicked off. And once, we went, once the invasion of Iraq uh, happened, uh, they realized that manpower was extremely limited. And so, you know, I, I graduated high school in 2004. And what was it, 2003? I can't even remember now. Um, <laughs> I think it was, too. I think I did graduate in 2003. And so the Iraq, well, yeah, that's, that's correct. And so I went to school. I, went to, I started going to Miami-Dade College, and I was going to school for writing because I figured that would be, um, you know, what to do. But my dad wanted me to go to school for criminal justice. So I was taking criminal justice courses that I really didn't want to take, but uh, it seemed like a viable plan considering the way that the world was headed. And I was like, I don't, I don't know that my dream is going to happen. And so I was, you know, letting other people's opinions and letting – you know, events in the world impede on, on my dreams and my goals. And, and I was just doing things that I didn't want to do for reasons that I shouldn't have. And ultimately, um, I was working, I got a job working at Hollywood Video. So 
I actually applied for the wrong position. <laughs> I applied for the wrong position because when I filled it out, it had like this weird, it wasn't online or anything, and it wasn't a paper. There was a weird kiosk, and the kiosk had questions, and it asked, what would you like to be? Would you be an actor or a director or whatever? And so I was like, yeah, director, that's what I want to be. And turns out that, that that meant that I was applying for the management position. So after filling out the application, they called me, I did my interview, and I, apparently I did really well. And they said, wow, I, I'm, you're so young, and I'm, I'm so surprised that you would, you would think to apply for the management position. And I kind of like... In, inside, I was like, wait, what? And I tried not to let that be physical. And they were like, they, they asked me, they said, so you, you did apply for the management position. And without skipping a beat, I said, yes, I definitely did. <laughs> so, you know, that wasn't true at all, but I was not going to let them know that. So I said, yes, that is exactly what I did. And I got the job. So I wasn't the full manager. I was the assistant manager. But after about uh, four months there, um, the manager announced their retirement and um, they were interviewing people for the management position. And I, I, since I was the um, assistant manager anyway, I, I became the de facto manager until either they found another manager or until um, you know, I could get the position uh, officially. So I became the manager and even though I was still being paid as the assistant manager and uh, that kind of became a thing for a while. I was I was getting sort of mistreated in that sense because I was doing the job of the manager, but I was being, only being paid as the assistant manager. And then after doing that for about two months, they announced that they were bringing somebody else in from somewhere else as the manager, and I was going to work for that person. And he was awful. He was absolute awful. And it was it was a stab in the back. I was like, you know, I, I gave a lot to this, and I, I, I've done really well, and, like, there's there's not a lot of people that have made these leaps and bounds. And then here comes this manager who was threatened by me because I guess he was vying for a district manager position and he didn't get that. And he was just very bitter, bitter, very bitter guy. And I got the call about a month left. They were dealing with this guy. Like it was, it was really awful. Like he was just abusive to everyone, man. He very, very much so. And I got the call one day that because of what happened in Iraq, because of the invasion and, you know, manpower, that, hey, those old rules, those are gone. Like, eh, no problem. You got asthma, you got flat feet, doesn't matter, come on down. Like, it did not matter. So they called me up and they said, hey, all that stuff's waverable. You want to go to the Army? And I was like, yes. Because not only was I working at Hollywood Video, I was also in school. And I wasn't doing that that well. Um, my parents had a car. I didn't have my own car. And my sister was going to school. She was in elementary school. Both my parents worked and we shared one car. So we were literally like it was getting up super early to take one person to work and then drop that person off. And we were all sharing the car. And like this was something that was ongoing. I was going to school during the day and then I was closing. Um, I had to drive from South Miami to Kendall to go to school because I was going to Miami Day Kendall campus. And then my dad worked at Home Depot down in, in Cutler Ridge, which is now Cutler Bay. And then my mother worked at this big building called PRC, which was like a it was a call center. And that was also in, in Cutler Ridge or Cutler Bay right by my job. So like we would, you know, I might park my car, one of us would walk over and, and get the car and we were all just, you know, pick up this one, pick that one and just like it was constant back and forth. So somebody had to go and pick up my sister at three o'clock and then somebody had to go and pick up my dad when he got out of work at five or whatever. And then I would have to close um, the, the video store, Hollywood Video, and it would be like, you know, one o'clock in the morning that I would get out. And this was just awful. Like there was no free time. It was nothing but work, 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 work and school, school, school. And it was just a drag and I was doing really well at work but I wasn't doing really great at school and I started to notice that this is probably what's gonna happen I'm probably gonna end up dropping out of school and then I'm gonna end up doing this job and doing this for a while and then who knows where that's gonna lead and then maybe I'm gonna make that my priority and then it's like your goal is to become district manager of this video store and that's just not what I wanted in life and I saw other people that would do that and they're a manager and then they become a manager and then that just suddenly becomes your life inexplicably and I didn't want that and so the first opportunity to get out, I was gone. And it was probably the best decision. I mean, it's definitely the best decision I ever made at the time because um, Hollywood Video ended up going out of business shortly thereafter. They ended up going bankrupt. Turns out that that manager was stealing. Um, it was a lot of drama, a lot. And it, it, it sunk, that ship sunk fast. And when I left, I quit mimicking uh, a scene from, it's, it's a video store, right? So I, I decided to mimic a scene from uh, half-baked on my way out. So what I did initially was 
he scheduled me for like a like two shifts back to back, like 16 hours to do inventory or something, which was not legal and not like good at all while he was off like smoking weed. Like he was also a pothead. And I was like, dude, what the hell? So instead, like he'd already done this to me before. And I guess they were they did something wrong and they needed to do something again, or I don't remember, what, or maybe it was like when he first came in, they did inventory, and now we were doing inventory for like annually or whatever. And so I was like, dude, he's doing this again after I told him like, that's not right. This is like, a, and he's again, super abusive and trying to like, you know, exert power. So ultimately I said, instead of going against it and fighting, I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'll do it. And you know what? I, I, I got it. And he was like, Essentially, he wanted me to pull these shifts because he was supposed to, that's what it was. He was supposed to pull one shift, like I think it was in the morning, and then I had the evening. But he wanted to go to the beach. He wanted to go to Fort Lauderdale and go to the beach. And so he's basically, I'm going to schedule you twice so I can go to the beach, which was absolutely awful, right? So I said, you know what? No problem, man. Yeah, I got this or whatever. And he was like, oh, you're not even going to contest it? I was like, no, man. You know, I, I really just, I, you, you got it. I got this. And... When he took off, I said, yeah, man, I'm not doing that. And as soon as he was gone, like, I opened up the store late on purpose. <laughs> Mind you, I was, like, I was 18, so, like, I was, I was like, done with this. I was, like, no, you know what? I'm, I'm, op- I'm closing this thing down, and, like, I opened it late so that, that way he would get the notification uh, later on. But I waited till – oh, no, I closed it. I closed it. So I closed the store early, but I waited till he already told me he was in Fort Lauderdale. So he had drove 45 minutes out of town, got all nice and settled, and that's why I'm like, screw this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close up shop. So I literally walked around the store, and I started knocking off like <laughs> tapes off the, off the, the, you know, video. We at the time we still had VHS. We were, we were um, converting to DVD. So like, um, I think the last movie that we had on VHS and DVD was like Pirates of the Caribbean or and the Lord of the Rings. And so we, um, the first Pirates of the Caribbean, by the way, and so. You know, I went and started, like, knocking off some of the displays or whatever off the thing. And then I was, like, I walked over and I was, like, I walked to the front desk. And I was, like, cue, cue, cue. And I looked at some, like, this one guy that came. He was a, a regular. And I was, like, you're cool. And cue, I'm out. And I walked out the door. And then I texted the other guys, like, hey, are you coming with me? And they didn't want to do that. It was major drama. He ended up having to come back from, from, Fort Lauderdale and opened the store up and and it was just this wild thing he was like well, this guy just walked out and quit and it was just crazy and a bunch of us walked out like there was a few of us it wasn't just me it was a few of us that walked out but there was one guy that he he just he wasn't willing to do it and I've got other stories about that guy's name was Jonathan and I don't, I don't want to blow his spot up but he was a good guy but he just oh no it wasn't just John it was also Dave I forgot about Dave Dave was my boy but Dave Dave needed the cash, man. He was he was going through a lot. He was taking care of uh, his sister raised him, and uh, he was living with his sister. Like something happened to their mom when he was younger, and so his sister. I uh, remember David Foster. He was a good guy, man. Um, I haven't spoken to him in years, but he um, his his sister was raising him, and he was living with her, helping her out, and and her kid, and you know he was helping pay bills, and he's like, dude, I I need this job. So I don't know what happened to him after that. Um, especially considering that business went bankrupt. But he was a hardworking dude, and I remember he was a, a real close friend. Me and him became real, real close. Um, but anyway, the yeah, I got the phone call, and they said, you can join the Army. So in October of 2004, I was gone. I shipped out, and I went to, um, where did I go? I went to Fort, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and they... Uh, they had a reputation amongst other people for being called Relaxin' Jackson, and they hated that. So it wasn't because they did everything that they could to make sure that they didn't have that stigma, and it was above and beyond. So that was no, it was no easy thing. But everybody thought that Jackson was easy because it wasn't an infantry uh, training, it wasn't an infantry training regiment. It wasn't, or, or rather. Um, the base that wasn't there wasn't their primary focus they had other mos's and because uh, females and males trained together so in infantry units at the time it was only males so they kind of just saw that as ah they're they're you know weak and there was all these rumors about stress cards and all these things and they couldn't yell none of that was true absolutely none of that was true 
And so it was it was difficult. And I, I, in fact, a lot of the stories that I knew from people who went to Fort Leonard Wood and went to other different bases, and some of the stories that I told them, they were like, dude, what? We didn't go through that. So they had a reputation, like the quote, relax in Jackson thing, and they hated it. So they, they really went out of their way to, to break that moniker and to that stigma to get rid of it. So that was not true, not even in the slightest. So in addition to that, like, so... Um, you know, I joined the military right, you know, during that time, and the whole world was a completely different place. I think a lot of people don't realize like what that did. And I was probably the least likely person to join the military prior, prior to that. But there were elements involved. You know, some people will tell you there's only one reason that they joined. Like, oh, I'm a patriot, or I'm this. Like, I, wouldn't, I, mean, I definitely became more patriotic after 9-11, and lots of people did. Um, I felt like not just my country was attacked, but my home. Like I, uh, I, you know, grew up in New York. That's where my family's at. Like I, felt it was personal in a sense. And I also had, you know, didn't have a lot of options. Like going to school wasn't the easiest thing. Like I didn't, I didn't have like a dorm. Um, I was, I was at home. Like it didn't feel like I was in college. It just felt like I was still in high school. And then all the people that I saw in high school, they were there too. So it didn't feel like what people talk about college and going to you know, dorms and being on campus and none of that. It just felt like the, you know, being a super senior, I guess, like a fifth year of high school. I was like, this is, this is not at all what it should feel like. And then I'm working and it's, it's just worse. And I just felt like uh, this is not where any of this should be going. And so when I got the opportunity, I was gone. And then now in the military, I get some of those things that I, I was told the college was going to be about. I got, you know, uh, I got to travel the world. I got to, you know, living in the barracks. Like I had this dorm experience and other people that are, that are young and we're all getting exposed to different things. And, and you just meet all these um, incredible people from all over the country. And it was just exactly what I needed. Um, you know, some people, they reinvent themselves. And I think for me, being in the military gave me um, the sense of confidence to be myself, not not to create a new person, just to finally be a little bit more open with who I was in general. Because I was always that way with people that I trusted, but now I could just be that way all the time. And it just uh, allowed a different perspective for me. And in addition to that, being the type of person that wouldn't have done that before, like I wasn't in the best shape, I wasn't, you know, I didn't play sports in high school, I tried to play baseball, and um, I got selected for the team and I honestly wasn't even that good I think I played um I played second base and um I just wasn't I wasn't that great and and in addition to the fact that I wasn't that great I could hit I could hit well um but I wasn't I wasn't great at second base and honestly my heart wasn't in it because um I just at that time in life I was just very lost there was a lot of things that I was going through personally I'd lost um, my great grandfather, my great grandmother died back to back, and um, then my cousin died in a tragic accident. She was uh, in a car, and her friends were driving a little recklessly, and she was ejected from the car. And she was the only person not wearing her seatbelt, and she passed away. And so I tell everybody, you know, wear your seatbelt, uh, and you know, that became a very personal thing for me. So I don't, I don't allow anybody to get in my car without putting a seatbelt. And I, I always wear my seatbelt even if I'm moving the car two inches. It's kind of a, it's just a thing. Um, and it, that was really hurtful. Like she was just, you know, a little bit older than I was, um, just a few months. Um, we were close as kids. Um, her father and my mother were raised as brother and sister. They were actually cousins, but they were raised as brother and sister because my great-grandparents decided that they... That some of their children weren't capable of raising their own children, and so they raised them and and didn't exactly be honest with their heritage until later. Like, oh, by the way, yeah, uh, you're old enough to know now that uh, your that one lady that comes around is your grandma, and I'm actually your your you're, that's your mom actually, and I'm actually your grandma, and that's actually your grandfather, and those kids that you call brother and sister are actually all your cousins, and you all have different parents. Sorry. So it it's a very confusing thing, but um, I'll talk more about that on my book. That's con- but that's neither here nor there. The, the, the main thing was I was going through so much internally. I'd never dealt with death like that, that personally. And it was back to back to back. Within a few months, my, my grandfather, my grandmother passed away first, my great grandmother. She had Alzheimer's. And um, then she ended up passing. She was 90, I think she was 99 years old. 
and um, yeah, she was 99. She was almost 100. And my grandfather passed away about, uh, she, she died in February, and he passed in that December. And then my cousin uh, Christina passed away in May of 2001. So they both passed away, my great-grandfather and great-grandmother, in 2000. And then my cousin passed away in 2001, just before 9-11. And I always thought about that, too. Like, she, had she actually seen 9-11, like, she would have been devastated, man. And I, she probably would have joined the Army also, because, you know, she she loved more New York more than the rest of us did. Like, she identified with with the city. Like, she just had a vibe, man. I, I remember her, and I, I remember that being very difficult. Um, for a long time, that was very hard. Like, it's just, I, I didn't imagine you know, what that could be like, and she had, she had just come down, and spent the whole summer with us before, and like the, the, the year before, and just before she passed, she called my mom, and asked if she can come visit her, and my mom was like, yeah, whenever you want, you can come, at the time, my mom was like, out of it, because her parents had passed away, and she hadn't recovered yet, and the holidays especially were really bad for her, and so my mother was like, yeah, yeah, you can come, and you know, that, that'd that be great. And my cousin was like, all right, I, I really need to get out of town. And she didn't get a chance. Like, right around that time, we were making, you know, she was making, uh, I guess, efforts or trying to coordinate something, and then the accident happened. And it was, uh, it, was it was really bad. Um, we ended up not being able to take the whole family up for the funeral, um, only my mom and um, my aunt, who is my mom's cousin, but actually... Her quote-unquote brother, who was actually her cousin, her, um, his actual biological sister that he doesn't actually consider his sister because he wasn't raised with her, so he thought that was his cousin. So my mom is his actual cousin, but they were raised as brother and sister. And then here's his biological sister, who he was raised believing was his cousin. So <laughs> there was he was close with her but it was a different thing like if he says my sister he's not talking about his, he has two biological sisters and he doesn't really refer to them as his sisters he just call them by name and um there was some drama with the with the other sister which i, I won't get into but ultimately there was it, it was not a, a a good thing at the time and um so we wanted to make sure that at the very least my mother and his sister would go up there like, well, his sisters, you know, his biological and, you know, raised, that they would go up and see him, more importantly than anyone else. And so that's what happened. They went up to the funeral and whatnot. And those things had a profound effect on the trajectory of my life, 9-11 plus these other things. And I realized that I needed, you know, I guess, you know, backup plans, or I needed to have something that was a little more solid than this you know, seemingly, seeming fantasy of going to Second City and becoming, you know, uh, discovered and being on Saturday Night Live, even though I absolutely believe to this day that I would have crushed it and been awesome. <laughs> uh, so if Lorne Michaels, if you're out there, if you're listening, uh, let me audition. What's up? I'm pull a Donald Glover. But interestingly enough, the, the all that happening, the craziest journey started to begin like that was the it just the trajectory of my life was completely altered and, and, and in the best possible way but nobody ever joins for one for one reason and one reason alone and I joined because I, I was I'm a patriot I joined because you know I felt personally invested with what happened to New York to New York City and to what happened to the United States of America and I needed school money. I, I knew that going to school, um, that the Army would pay for it. Um, I knew that I needed a skill. I needed a job. And this time, I, I approached the joining the military in a different way. This time, when I went to my recruiter, I initially, again, went to the Marine Corps and told him that I had a job in mind. So I was always fascinated with, um, and I played Metal Gear Solid as a kid. And so Metal Gear, Metal Gear Solid, uh, Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty, like those games were out at the time. And those, like Metal Gear Solid 2 was my game. Like I learned about the Defense Intelligence Agency, spies. I learned about all this stuff from this game. And I, more so than like, and I've watched James Bond and that's MI6 and stuff like that. But this introduced me to, you know, United States of America, you know, 
uh, special forces, you know, military, Green Berets. This introduced me to CIA, DIA, the dynamics of those organizations, the NSA, like all these different things. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to become an intelligence analyst. I wanted, or, or rather, um, like at the time, I think it was counterintel. I wanted to be a counterintelligence agent and I wanted to be like that. Like I wanted to, you know, go special ops, be a Green Beret and, you know, eventually work you know, for these three-letter agencies, the CIA, DIA, and, like, that seems so cool to me. Like, I wanted to be the American equivalent of James Bond, you know, like this, uh, like, Jack Ryan type deal. And the recruiter was like, you don't want that. You want to be a, a 96 Bravo, which is a 35 Fox now. But he was like, it's an Intel analyst. And I was like, what? And so he said, have you ever seen the movie Spy Game? I said, yes, with uh, Robert Redford and uh, Brad Pitt. He says, well... Brad Pitt is the guy you want. You're, you're saying you want to be, but Robert Redford's his boss. He's the guy that's pulling all the strings. You want to be Robert Redford, and I was like, "All right, I guess that sounds cool." What it was was that they were really pushing for intel analysts at the time, and because of that, they they were really pushing hard. Like they were trying for intel anyway, but like I had a really good ASVAB score, and my GT score was uh, over 110. I think I had 120. Yeah, I had 120 GT score. And anything above 110 can guarantee you any job you want. So they're pushing for that stuff, and so that's great. But mind you, I went over to the Marine Corps first. So I go to the Marine Corps, and they were like, yeah, we don't guarantee jobs. It's need to the core. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Like, I don't guarantee my job? They're like, nah. So I can, I can qualify for all this stuff, and then you tell me I can end up being a cook? And they were like, well, I was like, nope, never mind. I'm out. So I go right next door. And I went to, to the Army recruiter, who was also a friend of the family. Um, and I spoke, I remember it was a, a Segovia, Sergeant Segovia, Staff Sergeant. And, yep, yeah, he said, that, is that what you want to do? And I said, yep. I said, he's like, this is unheard of. Most people, like, you know, we talked him into it. Or, like, I was like, no, I had a, I had a disc. My uncle was a recruiter for the Marines. And um, I looked up the, the jobs that he had. He had his recruiters. And, like, he knew if I had a disc. It had the 250 jobs on it, and I looked it up, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And it was initially the counter intel, but the intel analyst was was also, I knew about it, and I was cool with that. And since they were pushing it hard, he said I'd get a bonus, and I was like, deal. So <laughs> you're going to pay me extra just to take that job? You got it, bud. So that's what I did. And I took that, and I uh, thought, you know, I'm definitely going to do all this cool guy stuff, which didn't exactly happen i've definitely done some cool stuff but it's one of those things that you can't tell anybody about right because you have a clearance and then you're you're obligated to do things so i would say it's 90 10 principle right so 90 percent monotonous and completely boring and just whatever and mundane and then 10 percent fucking awesome and you can't tell anyone that and it's just like man all right you can keep it to yourself so got some great memories got some good experience and ultimately I'm, you know, I, I, was, I figured I was set up for success, you know, right after I joined the army, I think on one of the flights that I was on, I was next to a captain who was on his laptop and he was a reserve captain and he was a contractor. And I learned very early on, I think this was right after I got out of AIT, I was on my way to Germany. That was my first duty station. And the guy's sitting there talking about how much money he's making. And I overhear him and I look over at me, he goes, um, are you, you in the service? I think I was wearing my dog tags. I was super obvious. Like, I, I was that, that kid, right? I obviously had, like, a high and tight haircut and my dog tags on. And he's like, what's your MOS? I told him. And he said, oh, yeah, you made a good choice, kid. When you get out, uh, he says, I get out as soon as you can and become a contractor. He said, I, I'm making three 300000 over in Afghanistan to do nothing. And I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Well, when I went to AIT and I joined the Army, they flooded the market with intel analysts because obviously they put a hard push. So a platoon is supposed to be anywhere between like about 30 people. So you have a squad that's anywhere between four and five people and then four squads make up a platoon. So platoons can be anywhere between like 15 to 30 people, right? And, it's, and each company would probably be made up about three platoons. And, you know, three times 30, you're talking if, at, at max push, if you were doing this, you're talking like 90 people in a company, right? That's feasible, you know, anywhere between that and maybe 100. So we had 106 soldiers in AIT in our platoon, all right? We had four platoons in this company, and all four platoons were 
a hundred plus people. This was insane. You imagine having a squad of 25? Like, this is crazy, right? So, it was absolute insanity, and I guess the Army's mindset was, Let's, we're going to put an intel analyst at every layer of the Army, like every single unit, right down to the squad, to the team level, is going to have an analyst. That didn't work out. <laughs> it didn't actually make a whole lot of sense either, but uh, the Army's reactive. So, instead, they ended up having like a lot of people, and you had entire MI groups, entire MI brigades, and just uh, is overstuffed, which then led to a lot of an influx of contractors and government employees which then caused the pay to go down so when i got out my first job in 2012 i think the pay um when i started was 72,000. um i was a cyber threat analyst um supporting dia and at the time nobody knew what cyber was like or you know nobody really knew how it fit into the intel picture anyway but that was a good thing for me because then i started learning a lot about that and i made myself more valuable and now I have cybersecurity certifications, and now I have training in that. And uh, I've been called what is, I've been referred to as a unicorn because I have intelligence analysis experience, information operations experience, and I was actually certified as an information operations planner in the Army, which is very rare for um, non commissioned officers when you're not commissioned because there used to be a program that doesn't exist anymore. So now only officers, I was one of the last to actually uh, get that and have a, um, what do you call that? A, uh, a secondary MOS, so I had a, or excuse me, additional skill identifier, an ASI, so that was a 4P. So I was an information uh, operations planner as well as an intelligence analyst, and I also became an instructor. I was EO qualified. Um, I was a combatives instructor, which is the Army hand-to-hand -hand combat, um, just for level one, nothing too crazy. And um, in addition to that, I was cybersecurity certified, and I did cyber for the army and um as a as a contractor and it worked um in a reserve unit that focused on that was a first io command and we planned you know operations you know on the the cyber battlefield which was incredibly difficult because the you know, units didn't want you playing in those in those sandboxes anyway <laughs> they didn't want you coming up and messing up their network when they're trying to play war but that's that's how the future was going to be so i got a lot of experience in a short period of time and i had my feet uh, I had two feet and three doors, I guess you could say, but it was um, one of the best things I could ever do. It made me um, highly marketable, and um, you know my education was was covered. And the military, like it, it has its ups and its downs, but it's what you make it. And um, I very much had certain experiences that were you know <laughs> Metal Gear Solid esque. You know, I worked at DIA, and the first time I'd heard about that was in a video game, and then I worked there. Like, it's it's incredible how some of these things do. And and honestly. That mentality, I'm going to go ahead and be honest with how I got through basic training. Um, my uncle was, um, my uncle Octavio, he, he, he gave me a piece of advice that worked phenomenally. He told me right before I left, he said, just remember it's a game. The, the drill sergeants aren't there to, you know, break you per se. They're there to train you. So all the things that they're doing may seem like that makes no sense or that it's cruel, but it's all to get you to a specific place. Like if you all as a unit fail or you don't graduate or the numbers are low, it doesn't look good on them. So they want to get you to grad. They want you to graduate. They're not going to, you know, you know, uh, they're not going to like fix the system. They're just going to do what they can to get you in the best shape because that will also help save lives in the future when you eventually go off and fight in, in, in combat and whatnot. And so it's their job to get you ready. And, you know, all the screaming and the yelling and the smoking. And, like, when I say smoking, that's, like, when you get in trouble, they physically, they make you do, like, push-ups to your arms or wiggling until you fall down on your face or, you know, make you go outside and, you know, do exercises until your, your lungs are bursting out of your chest. And all of it ends up becoming a thing where one person gets in trouble and everybody gets in trouble. So if one person does something wrong, everybody in the whole unit you know, gets punished for it because it builds this this sense of we all have to get better and we all have to take care of each other. And even if you do everything right, there's going to be moments where they're like, oh, hell no, you're still going to get in trouble as a unit because it's just, you know, it just builds this this team. And at, at some point, you start to get better and you start to, you know, work with these people and, and you start to build a rapport and you can do things without even talking to people. And you don't even realize that it's happening. 
And the advice that he gave me before leaving was, it's a game. Pretend it's a game. And when that happened, I remember being in the field and like I, I, I called back to that. And I was like turning on the game. Like I, I would literally close my eyes and open my eyes and I was like, I'm playing Metal Gear Solid 2. And like, just go through it. So, all right, go, I've got my... Uh, I've got this, I've got my infinite ammo bandana, you know, whatever. Like, I'm, like, go- looking at this, like, all right, you know, what would Snake do? <laughs> and I know that sounds crazy, but it's true, and it helped me get, it helped me process this game that we were playing. And, you know, it becomes fun. You're, like, it's almost like acting. Like, I'm, like, I'm playing a role. Like, I've got to do this. I've got to play the role. Instead of just being, here's recruit, like, I'm, like, oh, I'm on a mission. And, and it, 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 it helped get through basic training. And then here I am, you know, going on to these other things, and, and, you know, joining the military, you get 100% tuition for school. So, like, most people hear about the GI Bill, and that's great. Um, there are so many things that you learn afterwards, like, or things that you learn from people, like, that are more than what you think they are. So, the GI Bill, yes, that's fantastic. You can get paid to go to school um, after you're out, right? So, you can, like, you can get out of the military. You do, like, your most people don't know the obligation, at least it was then. Uh, was an eight-year obligation. So even if you only signed up for four years, you had four years in the reserves where they can call you back. So you can either actively go into reserves or you know they, you can go into what's called the IRR, the inactive ready reserve, and then they can call you back. And, and that, that could be potentially bad because you could end up getting assigned to a unit that you don't know nothing about and you don't, you know. So I, I would prefer, I would say if you join, be aware that you should go into the reserves. And I, I'm, I'm a fan of the reserves because... Um, I wouldn't have done that initially. I'm glad I went active duty, and I would highly suggest anybody who joins, like, do at least some time active because, you know, the reserves has a different mindset. The National Guard has a different mindset. And um, a lot of the active folks, they have, uh, there's, there's jealousy and there's animosity towards those other people because they don't really understand how things work. But you also have to be aware that if you are active duty and you go into the reserves, it's not the same thing. And there are things that can be better, but you also have to be aware that the reserves is not the same as active duty, and you can't expect, you know, the way that things work on active duty to be the same. It doesn't apply. So um, I'll talk about that on another day because that's a very, very good conversation to have. But anyway, the um, ultimately, you know, I I I did four um, I did four years. I signed up for four years, and then I reenlisted for another four years. Um, I, I went to Germany, and then I went to. Um, I decided that I wanted to go somewhere. Um, that was nice and green and beautiful because I knew I was going to go to Iraq or Afghanistan. And I said, if I do that, I want to go somewhere awesome. And a friend of mine was from Hawaii, and he decided uh, he got orders to Hawaii. So I said, ah, I'm going to Hawaii. So I reenlisted for Hawaii. And a bunch of my friends, we all, like, got together at the same time and, and decided to go to Hawaii. We all reenlisted for, you know, and, I, and some of them got, you know, good units. I ended up getting 25th Infantry Division. And... um. One of my friends, I remember like being in the reenlistment office, and when I reenlisted and signed my paperwork, he uh, he immediately pointed to the map, and was like, he just like put his hand on, um, what was it North Carolina, and he was like, oh, so where are we going next? Like implying that we were going to Fort Bragg and we were gonna go. <laughs> he actually did end up going Fort Bragg and, and doing some really awesome stuff, and um, sometimes I regret not doing that. Um, I got an offer, and I. Um, I went and competed in some training that I thought I did really terrible at. It was a like a selection process, and I failed all of the tests. Like I failed the physical, uh, not the physical, but like the uh, the PT test. I you had to meet a certain score, and I, I passed the PT test, but I didn't pass to their standard. And then there was an obstacle course that I felt like I just did terrible at, and there was all these events that I just didn't make it. But yet they didn't tell me to go home, and so I just kept going through this thing. This like I think it was like two weeks. And finally, at the end of it, there was these two other guys that were in my unit. They were both, like, super fit, man. These guys, they had, like, six-pack abs. They were super skinny. They could smoke a cigarette and run a freaking two-mile in 13 minutes or even faster. I think it was, like, 12.56 or some shit. Like, these guys were, I mean, they just were, were in it when it came to PT. But they were absolute assholes. <laughs> they were just jerks, and they just were, like, so, like, they wanted this, you know, to be Green Berets, and they thought they had it in the bag, and they were just passing everything, but they were complete jerks, and I was getting along with a lot of the folks that I was on the team with, and we were laughing, and we were having a good time, and since they didn't kick me out, I didn't want to go back to my unit, I wanted to keep doing this training, I wanted to, like, you know, stay there for as long as I could, even though I knew I wasn't going, because I thought I passed, or I failed this shit, 
So at the end of it, they end up telling me, they gave me a, an offer. And I was like, what is this? And these other guys, I had heard them leave the office and they were pissed. They were like, oh man, I didn't get selected. And I was like, what? How did, how did these guys not get selected? They were bitching about it, how the whole thing was a scam. And then here I have this, this form that says that I, if I choose to, I can go do this. And I was like, how the hell did that happen? So one of the guys, I guess the instructor came out and he told me, he was like, I don't give a shit about those guys. Like, I, like their attitude sucks. Like those guys were fucking piss poor. Like they out here running like, I don't give a shit that you're good at PT. Like, how are you going to solve these problems? He goes, you didn't fail at anything. We, you like, we gave you these standards and you kept going. So like, it's, it's much larger issue. He's like, PT, you can get there. This thing, it wasn't like you thinking that it's in this evaluation, it's something else. And I was like, holy shit, that's awesome. And then at the time I was in a relationship and the girl that I was with didn't want me doing dangerous stuff and told me not to do it. And I didn't. And I regret that. And, I, you know, it would have probably been tough because, you know, you got to go airborne in order to um, be special forces. And I don't like jumping out of planes. Um, I've repelled off of, you know, like, you know, helicopters. I, I didn't go through, you know, the training. I, w- I would have loved to have gone through, uh, you know, 101st Airborne and, and gone uh, air assault. Like, freaking love that. It's so cool. And I, we had done some things like that in training and simulations. And I had also done, uh, you know, repelling from buildings. And, and I loved that. I thought it was awesome. And I, I'm a person that doesn't really like heights. So that's, that's an impressive feat. But I don't want to jump out of a plane. I don't have a problem jumping out of a rope on the side of a building, even if the building's five stories, which I did. I did a four, no, three. I think I did three, three stories. But I didn't have a problem with that, one, because I wasn't looking down. And two, for some reason, holding on to something feels different. <laughs> like, as long as I can hold on to something, I know you can think, oh, you hold on to your you know, parachute, but I, I don't know why. Like, I just feel like the idea of a rope is different than, uh, you know, a parachute that might have holes in it because that's allowed. You're allowed to have, like, I don't know many, how many holes. But anyway, I, I went off on kind of a tangent. But the ultimately, the GI Bill, you you use after you get out, right? So you can go into the reserves and use it. But why would you do that? Because while you're in the Army active or reserves, and I think the same applies to National Guard, you get 100% tuition assistance. So your GI Bill is unnecessary unless you need it for like, if you wanted to go to school and then receive, they, they, they pay out uh, an allowance for housing. So if you go to school full time, you get an allowance for housing that, you know, depending on where you live um, is, is good money. So like, for example, in Miami, I think it was like $2,300 a month. And because it's, it's, I think it's E5 with dependent pay for whatever the year is. And you get that every month. Plus you get like a school stipend for books or whatever. But the, the important thing is that all of this is, you, you don't have to use that. You have 100% tuition assistance, so while you're going to work, you can take classes at night, and it doesn't have to be full-time. You can take one class at a time here and there, and you get your degree. So the thing about the GI Bill is that your GI Bill is probably not going to really work for um, like higher education in terms of um, like a master's degree. Like they, That's pretty much going to cover your, your associates and your bachelors and maybe some other things. But you stand to benefit saving that if you can, you can get a master's degree or even if you wanted to, you get a damn PhD with your tuition assistance. And you can go to you know, Army College, Army War College or whatever for officers. And you, know, you can get green to gold program, decide to go an officer and have the Army also pay for your, for your school or even go um, ROTC and you go to college and then you just do drills like you were in a unit and then they pay for your school and then you also become an officer. So there were all these options that I really didn't know about and I wished more people had talked to me about that I knew of before going in. Um, so that way I could have had these these education things benefited and, and pay for rather than just thinking, oh, okay, I got my GI Bill. But I did do school while I was in. I used my tuition assistance. But if you don't use your GI Bill, if you're, you know, say you start a family, you can pass that on. You can you can give, uh, you know, time to your wife, to your kids. You can divide it up, or you can, you know, say you only have one child. You can pay for your child. So yeah, so your your kids' school can be paid for, or you know, or your or your significant other. So when I was married, I gave. Um, when I say was, <laughs> I've, I've been married twice. So in my first marriage, I gave my. Um, my my ex-wife some time for school so that she can take care of some things and and she didn't ultimately she didn't use it which you know is uh she didn't need it she ended up going to school on her own separately with other things and 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 good for her i guess i don't know if she felt she couldn't use it but um, when we split up um it was kind of 
um, something that I said, you know, I, I want you to do good for yourself. Like it, it was some, it was mutual. Like there was that relationship was done. It had its time, and it and I decided that you know on on the way out, like you're gonna need this. You don't have school, and you should take a couple of months. So I think I gave her six months of school for free, and she didn't end up using it. But um, you know, I, I wanted to to make sure that she was all right. Like and and um, I felt bad for her, and I didn't have to. She did well. She did good for herself, and she's. Uh, She's got a great relationship now. She has a uh, her her own child. Her son's awesome. He's he's hang, he's hung out with my sons, and uh, he's a great kid. And you know her. She has a, a relationship with my wife because they bonded over certain things. They both experienced uh, some uh, miscarriages, and they had some shared experiences. And they were also had to deal with me. So <laughs> so they had some shared uh, you know trauma dealing with me, right? And that being said. Uh, you know, I, my, my wife now, um, I wanted her to go to school, and she was she was going to school when we first met, so I gave her some of my GI Bill, and she's used some of that, and then I divided up the rest for my kids, so they have at least, a, you know, some time. I have three boys, so they have some time to go to school when they get older, and um, I've used the benefits the military has given me, you know, to to large extent. Um, I've taken full advantage of those things, and there's plenty of programs and, and so much more out there to, to be utilized, so... I highly encourage anybody, if you have any questions, to reach out to me. Uh, I've learned a lot recently. I just met a guy the other day who told me if you're 100% disabled that the government will you know, pay for your, um, not only for your school, but for your, your children's school if you're 100% totally uh, permanently disabled. And also if, like, uh, reimburse for uh, student loans. Like he said he got 80000 I think he's four years. And so he had an $80,000 loan that was repaid. So... You know, those benefits are out there, but you have to know to use them, and the money's there, so somebody's going to use it, so, it, you know, you be mindful, learn these things, and ask people questions, man, talk to older folks, like, I was always asking um, people who outrank me, older people, people who had been in for longer, just asking questions, man, always be curious, and ultimately, joining the military was for several different things, um, I wanted to have a family, and this seemed like a viable option to take care of these things, it it worked for me. It's not for everyone. Um, and if you do decide that you want to join the military um, or you know someone that wants to do it, be smart about it. Like, look at the jobs. Like, don't just fall into a trap of talking to a recruiter and don't don't be suckered in by recruiters who show up. My recruiter showed up in high school with a different, uh, he'd like rent like the most badass car and show up at school and like flaunt like he had money. He didn't, he was renting those cars. He didn't have that. And the army doesn't like people. Some people think you join the military and the army pays you and you make so much money. No, no, no. You don't get paid all that much and you get paid by your rank. Like some people think, oh, this job is more expensive. Certain jobs will get you more pay outside. But for the most part, your skills will translate to a lot of different things. And your service will also translate to military credits for um, or excuse me, to college credits for things like you won't have to worry about physical fitness classes because you've been in the military. So that that'll automatically go towards that. So you have all these extracurriculars that will be taken care of. And then in addition to that, you have leadership skills, you have um, like writing skills, computer um, knowledge, you have all these things that will translate to, you know, extracurriculars and to all these other to courses that you won't need to take and to, to credit hours. And some of that's evaluated differently. In the army, we had ACE, the um, so you go and you, you know, take your, your transcript from all your training and then you send that to your school and then they tell you, okay, this is how many credits you have in X, Y, and Z. And each school is different. And so there's so many opportunities out there for people and I highly encourage somebody to look through it. And um, like my son has talked about, like when I, when I was, you know, he's young, my older, my oldest, he's 12. And he had mentioned like, oh, when I get older, I want to join the military. And I was like, look, I'm not going to discourage you from doing that because there are people who are like, oh, that's not, you know, I don't want my kid doing that. I want you to do whatever you want to do with your life. And I want you to, you know, have your own choices. And I'd like to give you informed information on those choices. If you do it, do it the right way. I don't just join the army because you thought that it looks cool or because I did it and you want to follow my footsteps. Do what makes you happy. Do what's going to make you feel, you know, something that's going to help fulfill you in life. And so uh, I told him, well, what about, you know, the Space Force? Like, space, you know, we're not going to war with the aliens anytime soon. So that's one thing. It's safe um, in a sense. And, you know, or maybe not. I don't know, 2023, who knows? But the the technology that we're developing, you know, we're going to be moving towards maybe colonizing, you know, in space, either setting up a, a, a space station or a space colony or, you know, something on the moon, maybe a lunar base or going to Mars and terraforming planets. Like eventually we have to leave this planet, expand because, it's, you know, we, that's just 
I, just the way I see it has to happen. And so that is being on the cusp of tomorrow. Don't worry about what's you know here today. Like what's the what's the new industry of tomorrow? What's what's going to benefit you going forward? What's going to make you more marketable? So think in those terms. So I said, hey, you know, that's something to consider in a few years. You go to school and you get the you know be, become a space ranger, <laughs> be Buzz Lightyear, and you know travel through space and time, and get skills for that. Learn to code. Learn different things. So like it it's a matter of being making your value and, and, and taking these things and saying, what can I do? And not just reacting like I did. Unfortunately, I reacted. However, I made, I made good with it. And even though I didn't, you know, I never went to Second City and I never did improv, I, I was in movies. Um, I was in TV shows. Um, I, I was in a film called Rampage. It was my first movie starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I was called, my wife signed me up for a, uh, for what you call it, for a, um, a casting call for service members, for military guys. And they called me up. I, I, um, after sending some pictures, they thought it was cool. I went and I did a, uh, a fitting and they put me in an Air Force uniform. And I was like, oh man, what is this? I did not, you know, being an army guy, that's a big deal. I did not want to wear an Air Force uniform. So I said, no, I don't know that I can do this. And, you know, ultimately I was finding excuses as to why I didn't want to do it. So they called me up. They told me I was going out there that I was going to get paid to go and do this, this role in Atlanta. And I'm thinking, I'm like, why am I going to leave my job? I work in D.C. And I'm making great money. I, I what I'm going to get paid for those those three days is not what I make even in one day here. Like that that seems like a, not a good idea. Mind you, I'm I'm making excuses, right? And I didn't realize why. So my wife calls me out and she says, "You're scared." I said, "Scared? I'm not. I'm not scared. Since when am I scared of somebody? I, I'm bold. I try to do crazy things. Like I'm. I don't know. I try to do them. I just end up doing crazy things. But." I was like, that's not it at all. And she goes, yeah, but it's not, you're, you're not scared to do it. You're scared you're going to like it. And I was like, oh, shit. I think she's onto something. Like, there was, it was something I didn't even recognize in myself. Like, I was worried that maybe I would get that bug and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be able to look back, that I wouldn't be able to be satisfied with doing the work that I was doing and working some desk job, you know, over in one of these companies because I wanted more. And for the most part, she was right. She had me pegged. And so, she said, do not talk to me until, you're, until you land in Atlanta. Get out. She called an Uber. She told me to get out the house. She threw my bag with my clothes in my arms and told me to get out the house. I, it was the hottest thing ever. I was like, wow, this chick, man. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. I was really, it was, it was great. And she didn't. I texted her. She didn't answer. I called. She didn't answer. When I got to Atlanta, I told her I'm here. And she was like, good. And I was like, oh, man. So I get on set and... I had actually considered, uh, I brought like my, I, I didn't consider, I brought it. I brought my reserve army uniform and I thought about wearing that. I was like, I cannot put on this thing. This is terrible. I can I can't, that's not how all this works. Like you, you're, you know, you're supposed to do what you will. But I thought, oh, nobody will notice. Like I, I didn't know anything about how these sets worked or anything. And this guy, like I mentioned that to some dude that I had my army uniform in my back pocket. He was in army. There was only like three of us. He was also in the army. He was a reservist or National Guard, I remember. But there was only like three of us on set that were actually service members. Nobody else was. And so that's jarring. You see a bunch of people walking around in uniforms that aren't in the military. And you're like, what is this? Like, like I see them hands in their pockets or like, because these are the things that you can't do in the military. You can't have your hands in your pocket. If you're outside in uniform, you better have a hat on when you're, you know, like or the cover, you better cover your head, you know, with, a, with your cap or whatever. Um, and, you know, nobody's doing this, walking and talking on a cell phone. These are things you, you can't be doing. Right. And I'm, I'm real, I'm realize this is fake. Like I'm, these aren't soldiers or these aren't, you know, service members. And it was just like really shocking because it looks like that. And it looked just like a buildings that I worked in, like this, the, the set looked exactly like the operations center that I worked in at my regular job. It was exactly the same thing, except for the fact that the large screens in front weren't real. It was a green screen. But other than that, it looked exactly the same. And when they put stuff on the screen, it, you, could, you couldn't tell. It was just like, oh my God, this is so weird that I'm pretending to do a job that I actually do, both in my civilian life and as a, uh, you know, as a, when I say that, as a contractor and also in, as a service member. Like, this is just, it's just mind-blowing. And, you know, I tell this guy this, this thing. I was like, oh, I want to put this uniform on. He goes, no, 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 no. He says, 
Air Force and and uh, the Navy guys are always the guys on the computers. He said, that's just the way it is in Hollywood. So he goes, they picked you because they probably want to put you over here. And, and they ended up giving me a desk. And I was like, huh. He goes, yeah, Army guys and Marines, we guard the doors. I was like, oh, man, that's so interesting. So the next time you look at a movie, look who's guarding the doors and look who's working on the computers. It's, you're probably not going to see an Army guy on the computers unless it's a specifically an Army movie. It's just really weird. Those are like the stereotypes in Hollywood. So I'm sitting there in an Air Force uniform pretending to be you know, this thing that I actually do in real life. And you know, that kind of made some things easy. First, I had to like take myself out of it and realize like, you know, on screen how something looks, how you would do a job in real life is not going to be cinematically appropriate, which is why, you know, when you see hackers in movies, they're typing on the keyboard because it really, if you're sitting there using a mouse, it doesn't look as cool as like typing and looking like everything's hectic. So you got to, you know, that's just the way it is. So the same thing goes with like movie scenes. You're like, oh, I'm watching this in the military. You're like, why did they do that? That's not how this tactical movement will be done. Or that's not how you fire that weapon. Or that's not. Sometimes it's just how it looks. It doesn't look cool. Like that's not. In reality, you're not going to fight in those ways. But you know, you see guys in movies where they hold the the, the the machine gun down at their waist and they're spraying. That just looks, I guess, cool on film in in a way. And so that's just Hollywood's perception of things. That how does it look cinematically? It doesn't. In, in reality, some of the tactical stuff, it's effective, but it just doesn't look as good on screen. And so it was amazing. I ended up meeting uh, the military advisor, which is a guy who was a special ops dude, and he wrote a book. Um, God, what was it called? Um, the book was about the, the guys who, they had the, wor- the bloodiest battle um, in military history since Vietnam. And his name was Patrick Brown, and uh, he was a military advisor on uh, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, on Rampage, uh, Avengers Endgame. He, he did a lot of really cool stuff. And uh, I noticed a tattoo that he had that was from a, a unit I recognized. This guy's this is pretty cool, and it turns out we had been in some of the same places, and we... He ended up like taking me back, like backstage, and introducing me to people. And I had conversations with The Rock because he's the military advisor. So I wasn't just an extra; I was also hanging out with the military advisor and working, you know, back scenes. This is not something that normally happens. I was very fortunate, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was bold in the sense of just talking to someone. And that's that's what a lot of these things have to do. It's just you, you, you know, have a. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and laugh at that. So my son, he wanted some attention. So my baby boy is in the back and you can hear him. I'm going to, I'm leaving that in. That's hilarious. And so he's like, Baba! he gets dragged off. But anyway, that's, that's, you know, I, I, being that he broke in there and that's a good segue. I did this for my family. You know, I wanted to help my parents. They were struggling at the time and living in Miami and my sister was having a hard time and I wanted to be able to send money home and I wanted to help provide for my parents. And then when I had my own family, I wanted to help people provide for them and, Tricare is one of the best insurance in the it's in, in in the country, and um, I think a lot of things would be a lot better off in this country if we just had better health care. Like that solves a lot of problems, and people don't realize it. But that's another topic of discussion for somewhere else. I'm going to write that down. But ultimately, um, that's my story for for joining the military, and it went kind of off on a tangent because I ended up, you know, towards the end of my career, you know pretending to be a soldier but the most significant thing that i ever did in my in my actual service was uh i was the last six months of my service i was in the uh, funeral ncoic so funeral non-commissioned officer in charge i was in charge of the um performing military funerals um at the time my unit was deployed in afghanistan and um we were we had we had some losses and um some of my friends passed away um uh, including Sergeant Gross. Um, man, I, it's really hard for me to talk about some of these guys, so I, I'm, I'm not going to mention their names now because that's it gets to me. But the one that really hit me hard at the time was Staff Sergeant Kelly, Sergeant Nigel Kelly. Uh, he was in Germany with me. Um, we didn't know too, each other too well. I, I knew that he was in the other unit, and we had crossed paths a few times. Um, we deployed to Iraq together, and... Um, we were in, in Hawaii together, in 25th Infantry. He was a, an engineer, and uh, I was in the S2 shop, which is the um, you know planning, the intel planning shop, and processing clearances and whatnot at our battalion. And he, he died in Afghanistan. He was shot in the leg, and he, he bled out. Um, what happened was they were, they were receiving fire, and the helicopter that came to 
to medevac him, um, was hit with fire, and they had to do an on-site repair. And they did, and they got the bird up and running, and they got him on there. But in the time that it took to do the repair, I think it was like maybe a four-minute issue. In those four minutes, that caused him out to bleed out too much, and he wasn't able to be saved. So a guy who was the same age as me, same rank as me, um, just got married like I had, like uh, had been to the same duty stations. Um, we had very similar career trajectories, and he got shot in the leg, and he died just like that. And that affected me profoundly. So I was assigned to escort his body from Dover. I went to Dover. Uh, he came from Afghanistan. They shipped him in, and the facility in Dover is where they handle. It's the, it's basically the army's, uh, like where they do, where they take care. So the funeral services for the for, the, for um, I don't know if it's I think it's all branches, and so I was supposed to escort him uh, to his final resting place in Arlington, and I was assigned to the family to um, essentially take care of the funeral services and um, all these things. It turns out that um, his wife. And I had met before, and we, we didn't know this. Um, she was also in the military. She was also in our unit, and she was a medic. When I was in Iraq, I I busted my knee. <laughs> we received direct. We were getting fired at. The base was receiving um, indirect fire, and some. I was. I don't know if it was mortars or uh, 107 mic mic rounds were coming over, and or 110. And then the the rockets were coming across. It was nighttime. And I was running, and my platoon sergeant ended up running into these low wires they were like i guess um i don't know if they were like telephone wires or like internet wires that were running from one building to another because the power came from one area but the computers were another anyway he ended up choking like he ran into this and it clotheslined him and i saw it happen and i i, I ducked underneath it looked back at him and i was kind of laughing like oh damn he got clotheslined and when that happened i didn't i wasn't looking forward and i ran into a, a barrier and i crushed my knee on a concrete barrier and flipped over it and landed on my back and then he came over me and was like haha that's what you get for laughing at me. i was like god damn it so i ended up um going over to um you know the, the medic because my knee was busted up and they were laughing at me when i told them the story to find out later that this was the same medic because she was telling a story while we were out having dinner with the family and everything this was i guess maybe after the first day of of the viewing and whatnot and we were having dinner and people were having some drinks and she's telling a story about this idiot who busted his leg and, and on, on, a, on a concrete barrier and flipped over it and what a moron and i was like I, um i know that idiot and she was like what and i was like yeah i i'm i'm that idiot and she was like, oh, my God. And we ended up, like, laughing about it. And we ended up becoming really close, um, you know, me and, and everybody there. I knew these guys in my unit, but I, I didn't really know them. And now uh, all these dudes who are here for the funeral and these guys who who knew uh, Kelly. And and it was just this profound moment where we bonded and I got to know these guys. And I didn't really feel like I was a part of my unit when we were in Iraq because I, I was on a different shift. I was on night shift. And... Um, like the people, I, I didn't know those guys. We deployed, and I had just gotten to the unit, and everybody else had deployed together, and they had bonds, and and I, I didn't have that. I was lonely, and I, I didn't really make a lot of good. F I made some friends in the ops section and stuff, but it, it wasn't the same. The people that I was close with were on different shifts, and and it was different. I was just treated differently, and and I didn't have a, uh, the experience that they did. And here I am bonding with these guys, and they're they're awesome, and we're still friends to this day. And all of a sudden. Um, you know, we're there at, I think it was, I don't know if it was the last day of the viewing or, or we're not, but it was the funeral and, and um, I'm supposed to stand guard by the, uh, by the coffin and they, you know, she comes over to me and she's like, you're not doing that. Like we're all, we all served. There's no way I'm letting you just stand there at the position of attention next to the, like go sit down with the family. So she was awesome. So I, I go down and I, I, it's whatever they call. So like whatever they decide to do is whatever they decide to do. So you know, she basically said, you're relieved from that. Like, go and, you know, sit down with us and be a part of the services. And um, I went and I stood over in the corner. I think I was having having a, a, a glass of iced tea or something. I don't remember. And Nigel's one, his brother comes in. He has his twin brother. And he walks in and I was like, oh, my God. It was like so strange. I didn't know he had a twin brother. And it was like, wow, that's so crazy. It's like seeing him all over again. And his grandfather walks over to us and he's talking to me and uh, I remember Strack was next to me and it was David and he was, he was a good guy and um, I don't remember who the other guy was that was next to me and we're standing there and he walks over and he, shakes, he says did you know my grandson? He said yeah 
and he shakes shakes our hands and he says, I told my grandson not too long ago that I wanted him to write his story, write down all these events that are happening to you and write down your story. And he said, ah, Grandpa, nobody wants to hear that. He said, I didn't get to tell him at the time, but I wanted to read that story. I wanted to read my grandson's story. And so he looked at us right, I mean, I, I felt like he was looking right into my soul. He looked me right in the eye and he said, write down your story because somebody wants to read it. And I made him a promise. I grabbed his hand and I shook it and I said, sir, I want you to know that when I write my story, that I will write everything that I can about your grandson's story. And I will keep that. And uh, as I've been writing my book, it, that's a significant portion of it. So I, I wanted to kind of just plug that and, you know, I, I need the motivation to, to continue it because it's, it's hard to write those things sometimes. It's, it's hard to talk about these things that are somewhat traumatic, but um, it's important. I made him a promise and um, ultimately that's a significant portion of my life. I, you know, in addition to doing that, once once I did that, I had to do perform funeral details. I had to actually conduct the funerals and, and um, call the commands for the 21 gun salute and train the guys to practice on how to fire the weapons and how to um, what movements to make and what commands to call and folding the flag and delivering the flag. And my job as the funeral NCOIC was to take the folded uh, try and once the flag is folded, you know it's removed off of the the um, the coffin and then folded into this triangle shape. That's supposed to. The reason for that is it's supposed to look like a um, uh, the old uh, colonial hats, like during the, the the revolution. So like what the what the I guess uniform for the soldiers was at the time. It looks like those hats. Like I guess that's the thing. And you fold this triangle and then you'd give it to the next of kin. And um. I had, you know, lots of different experiences. We had guys who just were retirees, guys who were just older and, and, and past. You had, you know, um, you know, when I say guys, I mean like, you know, there were men and women. And um, But when when a service member passed, like it wasn't always just from, from combat. Sometimes people were just old. One of the great experiences that I have, because I, I definitely don't want to end this on a downer, but the most significant experience I had, I'll, I'll say that one first because it's a downer and then I'll get to the happy one. But one of the most significant one was, um, and, and painful, was a, a young girl whose father passed away. Um, he was a first sergeant, I think, and, and I don't remember if it was, in, I think it was in Afghanistan. He was a first sergeant, or, or at least an E7, and, or maybe an E8. I mean, mind you, it was, it was higher up, and she was 12 years old. And, you know, this 12-year-old girl had lost her father, and we were instructed that the next of kin, that we were giving the, the, um, the flag to his wife. And so I was practicing what I was going to say to his wife and practicing you have to memorize a thing and then hand it to her, and the funeral would end. So everything goes off, and 21-gun salute, the, the, um, you know, the, they play the, the, the trumpet, and you get the, you know, taps and the whole thing. And, you know, um, right before the funeral starts, instead of uh, I get told, uh, plans changed. You're not giving it to his wife. Um, you're going to give it to his daughter. And I'm like, what? Who, um, who, which one's his daughter? And then they point to this 12-year-old girl. And I was devastated. I did not know how to do this. Uh, I, I mean, I have to do it, but I was like, it's painful. And especially if I didn't have time to process it. So what's great about this scenario was that my my soldiers were trained so well like we we were so good at this that when it came to me having to call the command for them to march off the field when i was handing this girl the flag i handed it to her i said what i needed to say and this girl started crying and i got a knot in my throat and i couldn't call the last command for them to turn and march off and they saw it and they were able to just execute it without the command and i was able to walk off and not let the family see that i started shedding some major tears as i was marching off but we were so in tune that they knew they saw it in my face that i wasn't going to be able to call that command without you know breaking and start crying and they knew that that could not happen in front of her and one of the other guys took the lead on that and silently called to the team and and called the command and they marched off and it was amazing and that was such a profound experience like handing that off to that girl was one of the most difficult things I've ever done um, but I thought it was important that we had to do those things and 
Um, the great thing about all those things is you realize how much this is this family's last memory, you know, of this person. Like, I mean, there's other memories, but like you want to honor them in in this way. And there was another event where we went to, <laughs> we were watching. Um, we were trying to, when we were still actually training, we had watched a few other um, details perform their services. So we watched some Navy guys perform a funeral. And it was on the top of this hill in, in, a, in a cemetery in, in downtown Honolulu. And it was like very windy. It was like the top of a mountain. It was beautiful. And you could see all of, you know, Hon uh, Honolulu. And uh, make sure I correct or I correctly pronounce that Honolulu and it's Hawaii like <laughs> when you've lived there long enough you know and then like Hawaiians know so anyway um, you can oversee the city and like and, and you you see the beach and it's beautiful right and these guys do their thing and they they decided to you know pop the flag out and hold it up before they would fold it it was just kind of a cool motion to do that we had kind of adopt we learned from them to do that we're like oh wow that looks really dope when you just kind of like and when you when you're getting ready to fold it you just pop it out and then you do it well, these guys executed that, and it was on a super windy day, and the flag flew off into the sky towards the ocean. And we were like, oh, my God, what just happened? The, the guy who was running, this is a Navy guy, he immediately turns and salutes the flag as if that was supposed to happen. And I could hear all the people in the funeral services going, oh, my God, that's amazing. Like, they thought it was part of the thing. It wasn't at all. Like, they legit thought, oh, my God, that's that's so cool. Like, they did that. Like, that had nothing to do with it. So, you know, there are going to be times where things get messed up in these funerals. And, like, that's not what's important. What's important is the demeanor and how you react to things and how you were able to handle something that maybe shouldn't have gone down that way. Because this is the last memory that they'll have. And in one sense, they might not know the traditions or how things go, and that, that works to your benefit. And in the other sense, if, if you have to improvise, if you make it look good, they will have a, a significant memory from this, and they'll, they'll know that their loved one was respected and that this was done with dignity and honor. And I'm going to, you know, that, that's you know, a pretty funny story, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and close out with a, um, I was, we were called to go to, um, what was it, Kauai, to, to Kauai, and the there was a, a um, an older guy. He was a World War II veteran who had died, and they didn't want. Uh, we were flying out there to to conduct the funeral, but they didn't want a twenty one gun salute. Um, they said they had their own guys, and we were like, oh, okay. So we get out there and we find out that the guys they had were a bunch of these these old dudes that were deployed with this guy. So friends of his that he had served with, these guys are in their 90s, man, all 90s. These you know, small Asian guys come out and they've got their 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 rifles and they're holding it together and they did this 21 gun salute for their for their friend and it was beautiful, man. It was absolutely beautiful. It was awesome. And these guys crushed it. And I was just so proud of that. Like look at these guys. These guys were all these years later, these guys went to war in World War II with each other, and all these years later, these guys still have a relationship. They're still meeting up at this little museum that they created. It was basically like, I don't know if it's the VFW, but it was like their, um, I guess it was like their little VFW, like a little Veterans of Foreign Wars, like this little group that they met up every, every week, and they donated all of their, um, I guess, things that they had acquired in, during their, their service to this museum that they had built on site. And essentially, it was a World War II museum. It had they had you know flags and pictures and 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 all these you know weapons and all these different things that, that were there. And they donated it, and people would come and you know look at the museum. And then they would uh you know it, it was for um, donations. You come in to donate. Like there was no price. You can come for free, but you, you know, people would donate. And so they asked us to stay after the funeral. They were like, hey, can you you guys want to come back with us and check out the museum? We were like. Absolutely. We were supposed to fly back immediately, and we're like, screw that. We're going to hang out with these dudes. So we go to this place, and the guy says, um, um, we're going to have some lunch. I'm like, all right, cool. Um, he says, you, you, like, uh, you like sushi? You like poke? And I was like, yeah, I love poke. Like, like, absolutely. He goes, cool. So he opens the fridge, and I'm thinking he's going to pull out a thing of, uh, you know, they, there's going to be some fresh cut, or maybe they got it from the store. And the fridge is just full of beer. Nothing but beer. And I'm like, what's that? And he's like, oh, yeah, the, the, that's not the fish. This is what we're really here for. But he goes, a buddy's going to go get the fish now. So I thought he was going to go to a store. Not true at all. He ends up going behind the building, and there's like a, um, I, I guess like right across the street, there's the ocean or a, a river or something. 
and he actually fished some fish out, like right there, uh, tuna, and, and, and killed the tuna right there, cut it up, and, and made the freshest, like, poke I've ever had in my life, which is just, you know, raw, um, you know, raw tuna or, you know, like different kinds of fish. But it was like, oh, my God, it was amazing. And then we're just slamming beers, which, by the way, you know, you should eat before you drink. And we were already drinking. And fish doesn't really exactly do it. Like, it's not going to coat your stomach enough for you to not get tanked. So we got tanked. So then these guys take us over to, and by, and by the way, they outdrank us incredibly. I was like, oh my God, these guys are out of control. Like, they are awesome, man. They could, they were drinking us under the table. And we're, you know, I was at 20, 24, 25. Anyway, um, no, I think it was 26. And the, these guys are in their 90s, man. It's amazing. So they take us over to the, to the, um, to the, the museum and we're walking around. And I see this picture of one of the guys with, uh, General Shinseki, but it wasn't a general. This is a he says that's Lieutenant Shinseki, and I was like, like as in General Shinseki, the 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 head of the of the VA. He says, yeah. I was like, what? He tells me, hey, that was he was our um, our platoon leader, and I was like, wow, that is crazy, man. And they started telling all these stories about Lieutenant Shinseki, and if you know anything about Shinseki, look look him up. Like you can imagine that there were some interesting stories. <laughs> anyway. Um, Shinseki is also the guy who, uh, who instituted the beret. So the black beret came about because originally black berets were for, um, if I'm not mistaken, for, um, rangers. Green berets are for special forces and the tan berets were for airborne and the black beret was for, um, for rangers. And everybody got a black beret and they ended up giving the tan, like a tan beret to, to the rangers, if I'm not mistaken. And... Uh, a lot of people hated it. People hated the beret, and it also dumbed down what the beret is like. The green beret, the maroon beret, and the tan beret, um, those are, you know, imp important. You you earn them through these qualifications. You earn them through, you know, whether being in a unit assigned to that unit or, you know, by uh, by having this skill identifier. Like, you earn that. So giving everybody a beret was just like, mm, no, no, that, that didn't help. That didn't make everybody look awesome. You come to find out later that Shinseki's wife owned the company that, that made the berets. Go figure, right? So anyway, like, no wonder he instituted that. They got paid. But anyway, so these, these guys then show me another picture of um it, it was a small picture and then it was blown up and they had this giant mural of a guy playing ukulele with elvis presley there's elvis presley with a ukulele in his hand and the guy's next to him and i was like whoa that is awesome and he goes do you know who that guy is and i said well that's elvis he goes no the other guy i said no he goes that's the guy we did the funeral for so the guy we had just done the funeral had, you know, he, I said, oh, my God, it's amazing. He played ukulele with Elvis Presley. The guy goes, no, man. He goes, the story's way cooler than that. He goes, he taught Elvis how to play ukulele. <laughs> my mind was blown. I was like, wow, dude, this guy was awesome. And we just conducted a funeral. We just, you know, paid respect to this guy, and he was amazing. And if you ever get a chance to go out to, uh, to Kauai, um, in, in, in Hawaii and, and find this place. I need to find the details on it, but like this, you know, this World War II, and the island's not big. It's like one, um, I, I, I want to say there's one two-lane road that goes around the whole island. So if, if, you, if you know, you know, just, you know, go to this World War II, um, uh, you know, this veterans um, museum and, and talk to those guys, man. They're amazing. And, and I last heard, I don't know how many of them are still alive now, but when I last heard, they were meeting up there like every weekend. Um, and mind you, this was in 2011, so I don't, I don't know if those guys are still around, um, which is, when I think about it, pretty sad now. But those guys were amazing, man. I had an amazing time, and we ended up flying back, um, like, I don't know, in the middle of the night or whatever, and we, we were absolutely obliterated. Those guys, like, sick to our stomachs, like, those guys drank us under the table. It was absolute insanity. Um, and then we flew back to Hawaii and I was like, oh my God, we got to go to work the next day. It was, oh man, I remember being hung over. That was crazy. But, um, those are the kinds of stories that you, you get when you, when you join the service. These are, these are just, I mean, I have so many stories, but, um, these are the kind of things that, that happen when you, when you, you know, dedicate your life to something like that. When you meet these people that I know that I can call up, um, some of the people that I've met in my life and, and, and that I've met in the service. And right now, if I were, I hadn't seen them in two years. And right now, if we start, we sit together, it's like we never lost touch. There are certain bonds that 
are inexplicable. Like you have bonds with, you know, you have a best friend or you have a sibling or, um, you know, with your parents. Like each one of these bonds is different. Like I say, like love is categorized differently. Like you love your mom in a completely different way than you love your significant other, like your spouse or your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. Um, it, they're both love, but they're completely different way. One is romantic, one is, you know, familial. And, and there's variations of that. Like you love your best friend differently than you would you know, um, a, a cousin or, you know, other people. It's just different. There's so much nuance, you know, and you love a brother or sister differently than you would one of your children. Like, there's so many differences and nuances to this that I look at it the same way in that with friends and all these variations, there is a bond that is between people who have served and especially people who have deployed together or even been in, in similar situations where you develop a bond that is on a completely different level. It's not necessarily more or less, you know, in a, in a, when it comes to like in a romantic sense, it, it just is a different thing. So you have that bond that exists in almost in, indescribable. You have a this camaraderie that people maybe people like use that word a lot but it's it's hard to effectively describe it you have a rapport and you have this connection with people that that transcends all these other things and it transcends you know race it transcends biases it transcends um, all these other things that we block and we put up to divide ourselves and and these experiences transcend that that like you look at this person and there's you're, there's no labels in that like you are inexplicably bonded you are brethren you are you know that is your brother your sister your you know it's just something incredible and it's hard to effectively describe it's just something you feel it's not something you can really um put words to it's i'm, I'm having a hard time describing it now but it's just something that you feel it's just something that's there and i think that's kind of how love is like when you're like actually in love if you've been in love before and you find you know what you consider to be true love it's hard to describe, you know, what the difference is. You're like, I knew that I loved this person, but that wasn't, I wasn't in love, and this is love. Like, I know that the bond that I have with, with my wife, if I can tell that, like, wow, when we reconnected, because we knew each other in high school and she didn't know I exist, but when we reconnected and, um, and fell in love, like, I was like, wow, this is what that feels like. And it was, it, it's incredible. And it's still like, we've been together for, um, you know, I, I guess seven, seven or eight years. And it doesn't feel like that at all. Um, and that's a great thing. Like, she's still the first person I want to talk to about everything. And she, you know, knows things about me that I, I don't have to say, like we can, we're in tune with each other on things. And, and we discuss things with each other. And it's a bond. And I feel like there's, you know, a similar bond when you have this, when you've deployed with someone or you've served with someone where it's like other people really can't understand it. It's just a thing. And it might not make sense from the outside, but it just kind of does make sense to you. It's a conundrum, I would say. And uh, it's just interesting, paradoxical concepts, but uh, it's just the way it is. And so if anybody's thinking about, you know, you know serving in the military, I, I, I highly recommend it. I've, I've, uh, my experiences in service were amazing and it helped me develop into the person that I am and it helped me um, I, I think that you know when I was on set and rampage and, and I, I was talking to these folks I, I was bold because I was you know I had the confidence that was built in me through the military overcoming these obstacles that I didn't think I could overcome you know I wasn't a, a strong runner and here I am running two miles in in under 15 minutes and you know here I am doing pull-ups and here you know repelling off of buildings and and just doing things that I thought like, physically I probably, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do and, and suddenly I'm doing them. Some of you are not thinking about it. You're just doing it. And uh, I spent a year in Iraq and I, you know, I survived. I've been blown up, been shot at, been, you know, like all these traumatic experiences and yet I'm still going. And every single one of them was was brought upon through the building of this confidence and the nature of of these of these things um just experiences and, and becoming learning about yourself and being confident in who you are and sometimes just not even thinking about doing something just doing it and reacting to it afterwards you just got to get the job done it's not about running you know, running sucks i don't want to think about running but i'm going to run those two miles and then i'll deal with the consequences of the two miles after i puke at the end of the <laughs> after i've crossed the finish line um 
and I actually passed basic training with a with a uh, what do you call it with bronchitis. I went to uh, I, I I was actually given an opportunity. I went to the hospital and they were going to put me on quarters, which meant like I, I had to be locked in the hospital and I was going to miss my PT test, which meant I was going to fail and then I was going to be stuck there. And my drill sergeant showed up in a van and uh, he wasn't going to sign me out. But like the timing was incredible. He basically came over and said, um, the van's outside. If you stay here, you're going to you're going to get recycled and you're going to have to do all of this all over again. He goes, I don't care what you got in your lungs. If you run that PT test tomorrow and you pass it, you're graduating and you're getting out of here. So run like you're running home. Just imagine running home. And he said, the van's outside. I can't sign you out of here. You can't sign out of here. They got you. But if you get in that van, they're not going to track you for a little bit and you're good. You can graduate. And by the time they realize you're missing, <laughs> which is crazy when you think about it, you'll, you'll already be processed out of here. And that's what happened. That next day, I, I walked out that, that clinic. Nobody, nobody said anything. I just walked out the clinic, hopped in the van. He drove me back to the barracks. And that next morning, I went and did that PT test. And I passed it with like a couple seconds to spare. I crossed. I ran. And all I could imagine in my head was running in my neighborhood towards my house, just running home towards my house. And I ran. And I got to that finish line. And right when I got there, I like collapsed, dropped down on my knees, and got ready to start puking. And then the drill sergeant yells at me, you didn't cross the line, Cruz. And I realized I actually didn't have to cross. So I stuck my, like, my arm and like rolled over and actually crossed the line. And I made it by like two seconds or some shit. And then I started puking everywhere. You know you really ran hard when you start puking. But I, I almost failed it because I, like, got, I was like so relieved. Like, eh. Hey. And meanwhile, I was like two inches from the damn line. I didn't actually cross it. And he was like, cross the damn line, Cruz. I was like, oh, shit. And so anyway, uh, yeah, you know, sometimes it's by an inch or by a mile. And that's all it takes. You survived. You made it. You passed it. And these are events in your life. And um, I, I highly recommend the service for anybody. And, and there's ways to go about it. There's different ways. And talk to people. And there's different opportunities for things. And if you do it the smart way and you have a plan and, and you know what you're going to do when you're in and you know what you're going to do when you get out or at least have an idea and, and set goals and write them down and talk to people who know things and, and don't just go blindly and don't just follow. Um, that's one of the things that I think the military definitely brought out in me too was not being a follower and being a leader. Um, and I'd always, I think I'd always had that, those qualities, leadership qualities, but when you're not confident, you don't think that anyone's going to listen to you. Or you know, I was an E1 and I was in basic training calling shots and motivating other people. And I was given the, um, I guess, the Outstanding Performance Award in basic training um, for being like the most improved, like I, I most improved in, um, in PT, I most pr improved in, in, in all these, these qualities. And I motivated a lot of people because I needed that myself. I was talking to them, but I was really just telling myself, you get off your ass, you got to do this. And so like the more I motivated them, the more they motivated me and the more I motivated myself and we were able to accomplish things. So all these leadership qualities were, were coming out out of a need, out of a, a need for personal need that translated to, to these other folks. And I would, you know, crack jokes in basic training. I got to definitely tell stories about that in a different time because there's so many. But I, I would do voices of the drill sergeants and, and voices like do different. I can I can do some some mimic voices and stuff. So I'd hear voices and, you know, do some jokes at night and we'd get smoked for it. And um, I definitely got in trouble. I, I definitely have to tell this story later on. I, I got in trouble for, for something involving you know, changing my voice. But um, ultimately, like people saw me as a motivator. People were inspired by some of the things that I had done. And that was a drastic difference from the person who started, you know, the kid who, who was unsure of himself and just didn't know what to do in life and was you know, hoping that I could get an opportunity. And here I was saying, taking charge. And it, it allowed me to be confident. So if you're considering joining the service or you know someone who's joining the service, tell them, talk to people, encourage them, and, um, you know, just be smart about it. Like, I, I recommend it. And I think that um, it's it's more than just being patriotic. It's it's having opportunities that you may not have been accustomed to. And um, it, it does things for you. It, it does. It opens up things and it allows you to meet people and, and see the world. And there's so much opportunity. Um, and so just if, if, if you know someone who's thinking about it, be smart about it and talk to people, not just recruiters because they're just going to tell you what you want to hear or what, you know, 
They're just going to tell you a bunch of crap to get you to sign paperwork. Their, their job isn't to keep you in. Their job's just to get you across the line. So don't, don't listen. Like, you know, be knowledgeable. Do your homework. Talk to people. And, um, and yeah, and, and, and have some fun. Like, if, you, if you're already in and you're scared, have some fun. Um, I think that's important. And um, there are things that I will take with me forever. And clearly, I'm having a hard time figuring out where to end this. But <laughs> no, but I'm serious. Like, it's, it's, there's so much I could say about service. There's so much I can talk about. And um, I realize that I definitely want to. So I will definitely be talking about this more in the coming weeks um, on my YouTube channel, Story Avenue. It's actually under my name, so just Paul Cruz. But, like, um, the reason I put Story Avenue in there and, like, the kind of theme going forward to Story Avenue, because that's the title of my book. And um, it's, it's a, I guess you could say, a comedic, um, nonfiction, narrative form uh, memoir. But um, there's, a, there's a lot in there. Like, it's not just about service. It's about... And not it's about the people that have contributed to my life and, and what, that, what those things are, my family and my friends and um, why those experiences and those people, those connections have all contributed to my success and, and, and to my stumbles and to how I overcome my, my obstacles. And I ultimately, you know, um, I'm going to be talking more on, on, on maybe on the next episode about um, my military service and how that felt like, um, you know, what it was like being, um, you know, a Latino in, in the service. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I'm, you know, Puerto Rican and uh, there aren't many that I know of, many Puerto Rican, um, you know, uh, all source intelligence analysts or intel analysts or MI guys or, um, you know, information operations planners or or cybersecurity folks like it's it's not something you see every day and and that's that's caused you know that's that's caused me to have to fight for for certain job positions and fight you know to um you know make a name for myself because people you know they don't think of you as that and so you know it, it it's it's an added obstacle but I, i've overcome that obstacle in a lot of senses and um hopefully i've changed people's perspective and they don't just think oh I'm a puerto rican as a doing computer stuff that doesn't make sense and yeah you know there are lots of us that are smart and we don't have to settle for you know what we're thrown like we can forge our own paths and i'm really really grateful for the people that have been in my life and i'm, I'm grateful for all of my friends I, i'm i'm glad that i had this opportunity to let this out i feel like i really needed to um, and i'm probably gonna you know maybe revisit this subject um veterans day or memorial day or whatnot but I wanted to say thank you for for this, you know, thank you for your service. Thank you for, you know, listening to this. Thank you for supporting these endeavors. And if you supported a military, if you are from a military family or, you know, you um, have supported somebody in the military, if you've said thank you for your service to someone, thank you for yours. Thank you for the support. Because whenever somebody says thank you for your service, I, I, I years ago I didn't know how to respond to that. Now I've learned I say thank you for the support because it means everything. Uh, military families are difficult and the spouses and the children they deal with a lot and it it's significant and those people deserve recognition as well and um you know it service wouldn't be service if you didn't have if it wasn't about the people that you're serving so everybody who's ever who felt that thank you so much and i appreciate you and if anybody has any questions i'm you know i'm more than willing to respond to that and I hope you enjoyed this because I, I enjoyed speaking about it and I enjoyed, you know, going this. I, I'm. It feels like I started with a particular subject and kind of went off. Like it, it was initially just the initial joining story and then it became something else, which I guess is what the whole point of this long form um, format. But thank you for taking the time to listen to this and uh, let me know if this was um, valuable to you and if you thought that this was um something I should continue to share. And again, keep an eye out for, for my book. I'm going to be putting more information on that soon. And uh, make sure that you uh, follow this podcast, Latin Experience, and that you also uh, follow the, on YouTube. We have the Latin Experience on YouTube, at Latin Experience, and um, Paul Cruz on YouTube, and follow me on Instagram um, and, and Twitter or whatever. I, I got some stuff. Anyway, you, you can find me. You know my name. And, you know, type in Latin ex it, it, Experience. It's there. Don't worry about it. And... That's it. Thank you. Appreciate you. And 